Well, Merry Christmas, the 360 Church family. Merry Christmas to you guys. Hey, thank you for joining us. And if you've joined us online, we appreciate you joining us as well. And uh, we're so, what a, what a great time to come and worship and sing. And, and uh, my name is Steve McCoy, by the way. If we haven't had a chance to meet, I'm the lead pastor here at 360. You know, I was sitting there thinking when we were uh, worshiping that, uh, you know, we're positioned in the world to be kind of the, the latter part of the time zones. And so uh, our brothers and sisters in Japan uh, started uh, uh, worshiping on Christmas Eve uh, many hours ago. And then as God just, uh, you know, rotates the, the earth, uh, it, it just that worship just begins to phase in. So if, just think about if you were God, you're just hearing worship uh, around the world just kind of come in at different times and different places, and we get to be part of that. And so what a great time to come together. And if you're here for the first time, and maybe you're in a place of your life where you're trying to figure God out. We have great empathy for that because many of us have been in that chapter and we understand that uh, as God is making himself clear to you, uh, that is a great place to be. So we appreciate you you coming uh, uh, and joining us and being together. So we've been talking the last uh, three or four months at our church about silence, believe it or not, because there's a lot of powerful things in the Bible about silence. And so uh, maybe three or four weeks ago, we began to angle that conversation into the Christmas story and began to see uh, how silence plays into to the story of Christ. Tonight, we're going to sing and close our service by a song that's been around for a long time, Silent Night, Holy Night. And so our, our focus in our conversation tonight is about that, about the silence that God brings to us in the form of peace and the holiness that comes that when God is part of that. So when you look at uh, this song, by the way, it was written uh, a long time ago, and some people wonder, hey, where did this whole thing come, the idea of a silent night come from? So different theories of how that started, by the way. This is one theory, if you, uh, if you look at this image on the screen, uh, maybe it started with a cold shoulder. You know, couldn't find reservations. Joseph says, hey, don't be mad. I said I was sorry. I should have made reservations. Talk to me, Mary. Mary, Mary. She's, I'm fine. I'm fine. None of us have ever been there, right? A possible theory. Actually, the song was written in, uh, in, in about 200 years ago, Silent Night, Holy Night, and it was written one year after Napoleon had been defeated in, in Waterloo. And so that in the midst of that, there was a great aftermath of these wars. Three to six million people uh, were, were killed in those wars that Napoleon led. And so when you think about writing Silent Night, Holy Night, in the midst of all that, it somehow doesn't make sense. Then I think about the Christmas story itself. And you think about Bethlehem, a relatively small town. There was no room at the inn. That meant that Mary and Joseph, they weren't the only ones that were looking for reservations. They weren't the only ones because the story tells us that they were called into Bethlehem to, to register. The government had called them to register. So we pick up the story there in Luke chapter 2 and verse 1. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. So everyone had to go and register. And everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, which is called the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room in the inn. Now, there are people sitting in airports right now that, that their reservation was canceled. And I don't know if you've ever been in that scenario, but they're not happy campers. So you have to imagine that, there, that the city, the town of Bethlehem, was kind of in a mode of frustration. It was overrun. There wasn't room for everyone to stay, so there was this agitation. Then you think about the words, all is calm, all is bright. Now, I don't know if you've ever been in a labor room, but it's not calm. Um, 
there's uh, screaming. Uh, there is, uh, you know, moaning, groaning. There's a lot going on in a labor room. So in that manger, and when, you know, the baby was being born, because sometimes, you know, Christmas songs, they're kind of, they're enchanting. But then you have to look at them like, is that really true? Was it silent? Was it calm? Was it bright? Only if you look from the outside in. But the Bible is an inside out view. But when you look from the inside out, it's kind of like when we sing Away in the Manger, you know, uh, and it says the baby, no crying he makes. Like, really? See, my child was a little different than that. Uh, there was a lot of screaming, crying, you know, trying to figure it out as a parent. And, and just because Jesus was fully God, fully man, fully human, it didn't mean he didn't cry. I mean, we're told in the Bible, Jesus wept. I bet he wept a lot as a, as a baby. Why wouldn't he, right? And so when you look at this, this, you think, was it really silent? Was it really calm? Was it really bright? Was, it, was that, that manger, that stable with animals, did that really feel all that holy? I mean, can you imagine giving birth in a, in a, in a, in a barn with a bunch of animals? And you think, man, this really feels sacred. This is a real moment here. That's because we look from the inside out. So when you look from the, in, the inside out, from the internal to the external, I believe this conversation and this message of the Christmas story is so critical to where we're at today in 2022. We look back on this year. It's been a tense year. It's been uh, a, a, an election year. That's always calm. Uh, that's always bright. That you know, we have our brightest and best, and it's just, and we it, this brings out, the election just brings out the best in everyone, right? Then you think about the invasion of Ukraine. You think about fuel shortage around the world. You think about the economy. You think about how difficult it is. And I don't know if you've noticed. My wife and I have just talked about this a lot in the last three or four months. The tension that we feel in our culture is measurable. When I grew up, I'd, I never had heard the term road rage. But road rage is, is on the increase. Have you noticed it? Have you been part of it? Come on, this is church. You got to be honest. The tension not is only in the political arena, not only in conflicts of war, but we recognize it in the checkout aisle in our grocery stores. We notice it on the highways. We notice it where we live. Listen, you may have it in your family. When Christmas comes around and Thanksgiving comes around, it brings family together, and it also can bring tension. So there's tension everywhere. So this message is a message that's critical to us because the external around us is like Bethlehem that night. It almost feels like in our culture, it's ready to pop. It feels like there, it's, it's a string that is just ready to bust any moment. So a message about internal silence and internal peace is critical for us because here's Here's the actuality of the situation. It's not going to get any better. In fact, if you read the Bible, it's going to get worse. There's going to be more war. There's going to be more conflict. There's going to be more poverty. There's going to be more disease. You guys have a great Merry Christmas. We'll see you later. That's awesome. Then we're going to close with that. If we just look at the outside, it doesn't seem very hopeful. But it's the inside that counts. So I propose to you that the silent night and the holy night, the silence and the, hom the, the holiness and the calmness and the brightness of hope wasn't necessarily happening in the craziness of Bethlehem that night and the Roman Empire. It was happening in the hub of that, that secluded place. And there is a secluded place that every human being in this room and every human being watching online has, and that's our hearts and mind. That is the place that, listen, no one can touch. Some people we say, hey, you made me mad. No, you allowed yourself to get mad, right? That is a guarded place, and that's where God works. God works in the internal place. Let me read just 
a passage from the Bible about this internal place and how he could silence the chaos, the conflict within. Watch this. Philippians 4 verse 7 says this, the peace of God, it comes from God, the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding. It's difficult, impossible to understand. Watch, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, when you think about the heart and the mind, it's where all our internal stress comes from. Those are the guarded places. Our heart, our emotions, our mind, our thinking. Those are the places, and you know it, where we go, oh no, oh, oh, oh my gosh, oh, this is happening. And here comes the news, and more news, and more news. And, they, and the, even though there's conflict on the outside, the conflict on the inside happens in our hearts and minds. Now God comes along and says, let me guard that for you. Let me help isolate that. So when I travel, I come with a, a, a I always travel with this, this large set of headphones uh, on my, uh, on my head. And, uh, you know, people think it looks goofy. You get to a certain age, you know, I'm beyond 60 now you get a certain age. You don't care what people think. In fact, you know, when you're in your teenager, your, your twenties, you, you know, a lot of you, you, you're really concerned about what people think of you, right? Then you get in your thirties and forties and like, you care a little bit less. You get in your fifties, you stop caring what people think. And then when you get, you know, to 60 and, and beyond, like you, you figure out they weren't even thinking about you in the first place. So <laughs> knock yourself out, wear a pair of headphones. These headphones, as you may have a pair, have a little switch on them. They're called noise cancellation headphones. But I take issue with that title because they didn't cancel the noise. They just blocked it. In other words, when I'm on an airplane, especially when you got somebody, you know, like a child crying or, you know, the, the sound of the airplane, and I'm like, are those working? And I'll turn them off. And I just test them. And when you turn the thing off, the noise is still there. When God gives peace inside, the conflict and the tension is still there. It doesn't cut it out. It just guards our heart and our mind, see? That is the mystery and the miracle and the value of having the peace of Christ, the peace of God on the inside. Otherwise, listen, this culture is going to take you down. This culture is going to overwhelm you without the peace of God in there guarding it. It's not like the world can give because we try everything we can. You know, and it's, it's fine. I take a walk. I, I, you know, run in the mornings. I do different things to just kind of, as they say, clear my head, right? But the problem is that's all temporary. And so we can, we can, you know, go do relaxation, you know, exercises and walk in a dewy meadow, although I've never walked in a dewy meadow. I'm not sure I've ever seen a dewy meadow. You can, you can do whatever you want to do to find peace. That's great. Keep doing it, but just recognize it's got a shelf life. God gives another peace. Watch this. I, I saw this picture, and there was a contest of a, a, an art gallery that said, we want to give our artists a theme. And we want you to paint a, a picture. And there's a, this contest. This was the winning picture. Now, if you were to say, hey, what's the, what was the theme? You might say stormy, uh, rugged. You know, there's lightning in the background. The theme was peace. And this won first place. As I look at that picture, I, it, doesn't, it doesn't, you know, emanate peace uh, from, from, the, from the picture. But in the next image, you'll see I've circled this little thing down there. And the artist painted like this little part in these rocks, and a mother bird is there with her babies. And in peace, she has found that secret spot in the midst of the storm. This is a picture of the peace of God that as it's hard to understand, guess what? It's hard to even describe it to you. People will ask me from time to time, hey, what's the proof that you have that you're a Christian? Just because you believe something intellectually, just because you agreed with the historic Jesus that he came, that he died, that he was buried, that he came back from the dead, does that make you a Christian? Is that your proof that there's a Christian? Well, there's many proofs, but here's the one that's near the top of the list. 
and it's the peace of God. It's that time, it's when everything is falling around you, but there's this peace inside that is holding you together that you know is not from you. And here's, so here's the first thing I want to, I kind of want to leave you with some gifts to take with you to think about. Here's the first one. You can't wait for peace to have peace. You cannot wait for our culture to calm down and then it will be okay. You may be having conflict in your family or in your marriage or at work or wherever your close proximity of circles are. And if you say to yourself, I'm going to wait for that, to, to, for the smoke to clear, and then I'll feel peaceful, you may be waiting the rest of your life. It's in the midst of those things that God steps in to you rather than you trying to make peace. Many politicians believe they're going to bring peace on earth. Keep trying. Keep trying. It's not going to happen. Watch this. The disciples, after Jesus had died, they were were freaked out. They had locked themselves in a room, their version of their effort of trying to get their own peace. And so they were locked in this room, and Jesus just shows up. It's a miracle. It's supernatural. He just shows up in their locked door. Watch this. On the evening of the first day of the week, the disciples were together in John chapter 20 with the doors locked because they were freaking out in their hearts, their emotion, and their minds for the fear of the Jews. Jesus came, stood among them, and said to them, Peace be with you. You see, God steps into our world and gives peace from within. Before he died, Jesus said these words. He said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. You cannot achieve it. It is a gift from God to say, I'm going to give you something in the midst of chaos that you can't get on your own. He said, not as the world gives you, but as I give to you. So the first thing is that we cannot wait for peace for peace to show up. It's a gift of God. Here's the second thing, and maybe the most critical thing that we should talk about at Christmas. Watch this now. You cannot have the peace of God until you have peace with God. What do I mean by that? Every single human being is is fractured in some way. We're broken in some way. We're imperfect. In fact, in the first service, I asked this question. I'm going to ask you, If you're sitting in the room tonight and uh, you're perfect, raise your hand. Awesome. (laughs) Love it. Way to go. You know, Jesus said, be like a little child. Be like a child and come with that pureness. I had one other child in the first service that uh, raised his hand. We asked him to leave. And um, that was totally good. Super cool. You see, God wants us to have a relationship just like this beautiful treasure here, who raised his hand. Because we want to have this child-father relationship, this child-God relationship, where we're like, everything is okay. Because if you're like me, before I had God in my life, things were successful, but things were really on edge when I thought about God. I knew that I wasn't aligned. I knew I didn't have a friendship with him. Even though I knew God loved me, I didn't have a love for him. In other words, I wasn't with, at peace with God. This is the very core of the Christmas story. Watch this. Luke chapter 2, verse 10. To the shepherds, the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for every single human being moving forward, every generation, every na- uh, nation, every culture, every age, for all people. Today in Bethlehem, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. It's interesting to note that why the writer just didn't say, today in the town of David, a Savior has been born. Because he said, a Savior has been born to you. That is the message of Christmas, that there was a separation. We were crying as a human race and God came to us. At Christmas time, I always love this story of a, a mom who uh, had their uh, two-year-old in the playpen. 
in the other room, and she was washing dishes in the in the kitchen. And uh, her dad came over, granddad came over, and you know, granddads are supposed to break the rules. And so uh, the child was crying in the other room, and all of a sudden the, the child quit crying. And so she went in there to, to figure out why the child quit crying, and come to find out that granddad had taken the child out of the playpen. That was that was not the rule. We're trying to, you know, we don't want to pamper over a pamper, so just leave them, leave the child in there. It'll be okay. So went back to washing dishes. A few minutes later, baby starts crying. Baby stops crying. Went in there. Granddad blew it again. Picked the child right out of the playpen. Dad, I told you, we're, we're trying not to pick him up every time he cries, okay? So put him back in the playpen. Back to the kitchen, crying, stops crying. Granddad did it again, over and over and over and over. On the sixth time, she's in the kitchen. Child's crying. Child stops crying. Go in there. She's like, okay, I'm just going to have to ask him to leave. He can't, you know, abide by the rules. Every time I go in, he's picking up. She was surprised when she walked in the living room. The child had stopped crying and had and granddad had not picked the child up out of the playpen. He was actually sitting in the playpen. <laughs> I know some of you guys are going to try that tomorrow. <laughs> See, the human race was crying, and God stepped into our playpen, and God said, now we're at peace. You can stop crying because I'm going to silence the guilt and silence the sin and silence it by sending my own son to a cross. And when we put our faith in Christ rather than our faith in religion or our faith in us trying to obey the golden rule or the Ten Commandments good enough that God might love us and accept us. When we stop all that craziness and say, I'm going to accept the gift that he gave of Jesus on a cross, dying for every sin, past, present, future, and embrace Christ and really as if I were falling off this platform and somebody catching me, have that kind of faith where I know that Christ is going to catch me and going to sit there with me, then we have peace. See, the peace with God comes because we have a Savior. Matthew chapter 1, Mary will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. That was the purpose of Christ's coming. Now, when we exchange our old life for Christ's new one, and we put our faith in Christ, instead of anything or anyone else, then we have peace with God. And we stand there like this child and saying, I'm right with God. God sees us as if we're perfect because we have Christ and not our own effort. Watch this. Romans chapter 3. But now a righteousness, a rightness, a peace with God, a righteousness from God, apart from the rules, the law, has been made known to which the law and prophets, Isaiah, Moses, Jeremiah, they testified. This rightness from God comes through putting our faith in Jesus Christ to all, to anyone who would put their faith and believe in Christ. Romans chapter 5, verse 1, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. I have to ask this question every Christmas Eve. And I'm going to tell you why I ask this question. But here's the question. Do you, in the most quiet moment of your life, when your head hits the pillow at night, do you have peace with God? Do you have peace with God? Is everything okay between you and God? Now, careful. I didn't say, are you perfect? Because nobody, we can't be that. I didn't say, are you obeying the golden rule to the best of your ability? I said, do you have peace with God, which comes through faith in Christ? Let me tell you why I asked that question. About five years ago or so, my mom's best friend sat in this, this room on Christmas Eve and asked that question, do you have peace with God? And she answered honestly within herself, I don't. And on Christmas Eve, she exchanged her old life for Christ's new one. That's how important that question is. In fact, I would go so far to say, and I know this is a bold statement, 
It's the most important question you'll ever ask yourself in your entire life. Do you have peace with God? Listen, it is a decision of faith away. Don't complicate it. It's a decision of faith away. What do I mean by that? You can say to God, God, I I get it. I surrender my life, and I want to be right with you through Christ. One more thing I'm going to leave with you. We can't wait to have peace until peace comes to us. Christ is going to give us that peace, the peace of God. We can't have the peace of God living inside us until we have peace with God. But here's the final thing I want to say to you. Living in America is a dangerous endeavor when it comes to our spiritual lives. Because we have so much, you can have it your way at Burger King and so many other places, right? And so because of that, we do live in a more consumeristic culture. And so we can, we can embrace this peace that God gives to us and keep it all to ourselves. And the mission that God puts us on is like, no, I want you to be an ambassador of peace, an ambassador of hope, an ambassador of love. In other words, we didn't give our life to Christ just so that we're okay with God and we're going to heaven. God then says, this is the starting line, and I want you to be, I want to put you in action. I was just standing in a, in a restaurant this, this, uh, this afternoon. It's a raw vegan restaurant. So if anyone wants to name all two of you, you just let me know. I told the owner, we, we got to know her and said, hey, I invited my friend to come down this week. And he came down and he said, really enjoyed it. She goes, you know what? I'm going to give you an ambassador discount. Being the cheapskate, I'm like, I need to say this in every place I eat. Even if it's not true, I'll take the discount. God is asking us to be that, an ambassador of what's good. The only reason I told my friend about this restaurant, it's really a great restaurant. You see, the only reason that would be an ambassador is because I believe in the thing that I'm representing. So Jesus says to us in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Well, when you have a child, they look like their biological parent in some way. They have the same DNA. God has given to us a new DNA if we've put our faith in Christ. And now he's saying, now it's time for you to be a peacemaker. So in our world, in your world, in your family, I wonder if you would be the first one to make the move. Romans 12, 18, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, not the circumstance, not the other person, but as far as it depends on you, Live at peace with everyone. It was Christmas Eve, 1914. World War I was blazing. In Europe, on the the Western Front, there were the German troops, and across a field, there were the Allied troops. And the Allied troops, American soldiers, French soldiers, different Uh, the different uh, locations in the Allied troops. Someone said, hey, wait a minute. Shh. What do I hear? I hear a phone. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) That's a part of the story. (laughs) Thank you. That was perfect timing. Thank you. That was awesome. (laughs) People are like, so I'm typing. Thank you. It really helps me up here. Someone said, I hear someone singing. And they listened carefully, and across the field, they heard the Germans singing Christmas carols. And and then the Allied troops, they said, let's begin to sing Christmas carols. And one of those carols is about the one that you're about to sing, Silent Night, Holy Night. All is calm. All is bright. In a war that had 40 Million casualties, 20 million deaths, 21 million wounded. All is calm, all is bright, and yet they sang it because of what it meant. 
one of the German soldiers yelled out in English across the field, come over here. The first peacemaker. The first peacemaker. Now, if someone said that to me, if I'm in war, I'm like, hey, I got a great idea. You go first. Let's see how it goes, right? <laughs> Some brave soldier from the Allied troops walked across the field and met a German soldier in the middle. And on Christmas Eve, 1914, they embraced. And then the rest of them became out. And they sang about the Christ, the Messiah, together. And then, this is a real picture. They played ball together. Blessed are the peacemakers in the midst of horrible conditions because they will look more like God than war ever could. There was one 25-year-old German soldier that said, we should not be doing this. His name was Adolf Hitler. And he allowed none of that in World War II. There will be no Christmas truces in World War II, and there were not. You see, we live in a world, listen, where everybody in Publix and Winn-Dixie and Chick-fil-A and Burger King, where everybody in the Buck Stadium, where everybody in your neighborhood, they need an ambassador to show them what God really looks like. Because God is being redefined in this culture, whether we like it or not. And he knew true agents of love and peace to bring the message of silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright from the inside out. Would you pray with me? Thank you, Father, today for this message of hope and this message of peace. We cannot find it any other place but you. That's why it's the peace of God. What a message for us, God. You think we wouldn't need it in 2022. You think we'd be more developed and more civilized. But as time goes, as the Bible says, there's higher and higher tension. I wonder here tonight if there are families in conflict. Who's going to be the first one to say, hey, come over here. Hey, come over here. Let's call a truce. Let's call a Christmas truce. I wonder if it's a neighbor, a colleague, someone that is just a friend, someone that's been distanced. I wonder if there, there's someone in the room that will go first. Because God went first. And when you go first, listen, you're going to look like God. And while we're paused in prayer, can I check in with you again about your distance with God? Is everything okay between you and God? Have you ever exchanged your old life for Christ's new one? Whether you're sitting in this room or sitting at home right now, watching, listening. Maybe you're sitting in a car. Maybe you're in a coffee shop. Jesus is the Savior of the world for all people. That includes you. How about you give your heart and your life to him? How about you exchange your old life right now for Christ's new one? Why not say to him in the most private place of your whole world, your heart your mind, say to him right now, God, I give up on religion. I give up on trying to be good enough. I entirely trust in Christ. Would that be your prayer in your own words? Because that's what God is looking for. Entire trust in Christ, his son. Jesus died for you 
for every sin that you've ever done, every sin you'll ever do, so that you might have peace. Why not say, oh God, I now put my faith in Christ. I depend on Christ. Here's my life, God. I turn it around. I exchange this life I'm living for your new one. Is that your prayer? Don't skim over. It's the most important intersection of your life. Oh God, I trust in Christ. Make it your prayer tonight. Thank you so much, Father, that from the inside out, we can experience silent night, holy night. All is calm. All is bright in the midst of chaos. We praise you for that in Jesus' name.